picture of what's going on in there? Val's done a couple really creative things in there with the kids. They're doing on this journey this summer, and she's setting the room up, and, and, and it's related to the Old Testament stuff, but with this new... And, and so you ought to go, and if you, you know, when you leave here, you're going to go just take a peek inside and see what they're doing in there before you leave and uh, how they've set it up. She's doing something different every week and pretty creative. So uh, I've told you, I know my, Val's my wife. I, I understand that. Uh, but I tell you, she is the best children's teacher in this county, hands down, as far as, I don't, I hesitate to say things like that, but it's just, I just marvel at her creativity and her depth at the same time and her love and passion for these kids. We ought to have a hundred, we should have a hundred kids in there, the, the quality of what's being taught. Um. Anyway, so I want to bring it. Psalm 2, why do the nations conspire and the peoples, this is not the sermon. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. And the one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. And then he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. Enough said. Would you go before us today as we uh, enter into a time of reading scripture and applying it to our lives and hearing the words of Jesus in the parables? Would you just bless us with ears to hear? Open our hearts, Lord. You know, the devil likes to close our minds to things of ultimate significance. But would you open our hearts and prevail and just have your way among us? Jesus. Would you stand with me and take a look at Luke chapter 16, verses 1 through 15. It's kind of long, so hang in there with me, and we'll be done in any day now. So, He also said to his uh, disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, What shall I do, since my master is taking the management away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So, Summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? He said, a hundred measures of oil. And he said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, and how much do you owe? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill and write 80. And the master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the righteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for he will hate the one and love the other, 
or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Look at that phrase. Not that you may not. It's not a permission thing. It's an impossibility. You cannot serve God and money. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, and they ridiculed him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your heart. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Wow. You may be seated. So Jesus talked these parables, and oftentimes he did it in front of the Pharisees, and the Pharisees reacted, but we'll get to that in just a second. As we get into this, I wanted to give you a, a list of, um, and this is not exhaustive, but it's a pretty good list of uh, well-known preachers and their net worth. You ready? Here we go. <laughs> So there's a net worth of uh, some people that are very, very well known in the uh, Christian world. John Hagee's worth five million. Joyce Meyer's worth eight. She has her own jet. Uh, Franklin Graham, ten million. That kind of surprised me. Um, Max Lucado, fourteen. Andrew Womack, fifteen. T.D. Jakes, twenty. Rick Warren, twenty-five. Tell you about Rick Warren. Rick Warren, I li- looked into him a little bit. Rick Warren gives away 90% of what he takes in, and he takes in no salary from the church and hasn't for a long time, in fact, paid it back. Uh, Creflo Dollar, $27 million. Benny Hinn, Benny the Hinn, $60 million. Pat Robertson, $100 million. And Ken Co- Kenneth Copeland, nobody can figure out between three hundred and seven hundred and fifty million dollars. So when some of these guys ask you for money, you may want to ask them for money. Some of them. So I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so Jesus tells these parables. He's still got fifteen million. He's still got 15 million. So he might have a, I'm not going to say it's not legitimate. I'm just saying he's got 15 million. So. so Jesus tells these parables to build a kingdom mindset so that we can look, act, and think like kingdom people. And oftentimes he told these parables in front of the Pharisees. Okay? Oftentimes he told it in front of the Pharisees so that the Pharisees would hear what he's got to say. And, and, and he knew that he was telling it in front of the Pharisees because he knew that it was not going to go over well with them, but they needed to hear it. Sort of like some of that. We may not like it, but we need to hear it and see it. So it kind of reminds me, this whole, this whole story and the event, kind of reminds me uh, when I think about this event, and he talks about shrewd. It reminds me of a situation several years ago when we were in Illinois, and there was a young man who had been visiting the church, and I had gone out and called on him and trying to lead him to faith. And when I was doing that, um, we were going through this Bible study together and trying to lead him. He was a he was a hog farmer. And his, he and his two brothers were hog farmers. And they were young, relatively young men, and they had some land as well. And he said, and my, and my aunt and uncle live in the same county. And my uncle uh, and aunt were, had been very, very successful farmers and had a lot of land. And sometimes they would do land swaps and things like that. So... Mark was telling me, he said, we, I got to tell you a story about your aunt and uncle. And I thought, oh no, I don't want to, you know, I'm trying to. <laughs> so he said, we were at the lawyer's office getting ready to close on a deal. We'd made a deal with your aunt and uncle for some 
things. And um, the lawyer had sent the packet around the table to all the people involved. And then the lawyer apologized and he said, I'm sorry that there's one thing missing in there that, uh, that my aunt and uncle had promised to these three young farmers. And he said, Mark said, and my aunt, he said, your aunt, and my aunt was little, but she was feisty. He said, she took that envelope and she threw it across the table to the lawyer and she said, that might be good enough for you, but it's not good enough for us. We promised these boys we would do this for them and that's the way it's going to be. <laughs> my uncle, he was shrewd, but he was honest. And Jesus here, it kind of reminds me of that story. Jesus talks about the sons of this world are more shrewd in their dealings than the sons of light. So I ask you a question. If Jesus were to take inventory of your personal life, what would he tell you to do to make preparation for your future estate? What would he tell you to do to make preparation for your future estate? Would he tell you to cut back on your spending? Would he tell you to give more away? Would he tell you to, I don't know, what, what would he tell you to do to make preparation for your future estate? So this parable, this parable is not real well known among all the parables. But this parable, in fact, this parable sort of repeats a theme that we had a few weeks ago. And you say, why do we have to hear that again? Well, maybe there's a reason. This parable was not real well known, but it was very important. The CFO is given in charge of his master's account, and he wasn't handling it very well, and so he goes out to these people who owed his master money, and he cut a deal with them, and if they owed him 100, he said, give me 50. If they owed him 100, he said, give me 80. And his master commended him, even though they didn't get all that was owed to him, his master commended him for his shrewdness in being able to at least secure some of the money that was owed to his master. It's amazing. And then Jesus says something interesting. He says that use, to use money to make friends. For he says, and this is, this is an interesting thing as you read that, say, what is he saying? Well, he's saying this, that the worldly people use people to get more money. You should dread it when your phone rings and it's a solicitor and, you know, they want something from you, right? They want to transfer money from your account into their account, okay? People use people to get more money. But Jesus says that we should use money to enhance the lives of people. And there's a difference. Now, all this stuff sound familiar? Yeah, we've heard that. So, you know, we've heard, you know, be a good, stu be a good steward, where your treasure is, there your heart is also, blah, 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 blah. Do we need to hear it all again? Well, maybe we do. Maybe it needs repeated. We live in a world which is greedy at the core, who is shrewd in the accumulation of material things regardless of anything else, who worships that. I'm not saying if you do well, that's a crime. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that we're, in, we're surrounded in this world by the attitude that you need to do whatever you can, use, walk on, do whatever you have to do to get ahead, and it doesn't matter who you walk on in order to get there. And yet Jesus comes at it with a different angle. I mean, look, he who dies with the most toys wins, right? And then Jesus comes along and he says something astounding. Look at verses 10 through 12. One who is faithful in a very little, is, this is just phenomenal stuff. 
One who's faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? And look at verse 11. I want to focus on verse 11 for a second. Can we have verse 11? All right, good. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? Look, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be talking about this stuff in church. We should be about higher things than this and more spiritual matters than We should not be talking about such carnal things as money and church. And yet, Jesus talked about money a lot. Because in reality, it's a very spiritual matter. Because why? Because it's a test. It's a barometer of who we are. It reveals our heart, our priorities. It reveals our values. It reveals who we are at the core. There's no getting around that. And so are we a kingdom person or not? And how we handle money gives the answer to that question amazing all right i know i don't need to labor the point you've heard it all before life is a stewardship we talked about this it's amazing that he mentioned this before maybe there's a reason he mentioned it before maybe there's a reason we need to hear it again because we need it pounded into our heads because we're always being bombarded by thoughts and attitudes of our world that are contrary to everything that he's saying here Life is a stewardship. I don't need to belabor the point. And how we manage our stuff here is going to indicate whether he's going to entrust us with what he calls the true riches. I don't even know all that that is. But I know that it is fantastically larger and greater and bigger than anything that we could have our hands on in this world. The Bible says, no eye has seen, nor has ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of men what God has in store for those who love him. Why the preoccupation with the accumulation of wealth? I don't know got to have some and it's okay to bless others and indeed we should but there's something going on here in this parable beyond this at a little bit deeper level and I want us to catch it the money manager did what he had to do to save his own skin did he did he not He went out and cut deals with all the people that owed his boss in order that so that when he cut them a deal and therefore they're going to like him and so if his boss fires him he can find friends around them because he don't know what he's going to do. He was shrewd. He was creative. And Jesus said the sons of dark, the sons of this world are more shrewd than the sons of light. What's he saying? What's he he after us to do or to be? Here's what I see going on there. He's saying that we should have the same kind of zeal, the the zeal that that guy had for his self-preservation for this life. He was 
worried about security in this life. And Jesus is saying he wants us to have that same amount of zeal in securing our future for the next life. Let's put it on screen. We should be as zealous, we should be as zealous for heaven as that manager was for earth. I could talk all day on this. I thought about making this just itself the sermon. Because what he's after us to do in our spiritual life, in our personal life, he's saying you've got to be about it. You need to have zeal for your spiritual walk. And so what about you and me? Have you set your eyes on a higher prize? Are you focused on the things above? Are you trying to organize and use the stuff of this life in order that you may be commended by the Lord for the next life? Have you set your eyes on the Messiah and on the Lord? Are you focused on Him? Are you trying to do whatever you can in this life to make sure that you are right with God and have a relationship with Jesus? He's asking us, in another way to put it is, are you willing to lay aside every other allegiance and relationship and priority in order to make Jesus the Lord of your life and live a way that is pleasing to Him? Are you willing to lay it all aside? Or are you negotiating? Every relationship, every toy, every priority. Not that we have to get rid of it, not that it's evil. I'm not saying that. I'm saying, are we willing to put anything aside or everything aside in order to make sure that we're walking with the Lord and living? life according to his will that's what i'm saying and that's what he is saying that we should be shrewd creative diligent zealous passionate about these things of the lord that there's urgency to this and this is what what bothers me sometimes as we live in a contemporary church because everything's been dumbed down and casualized and marginalized and the things that really matter have been put aside and i believe that jesus is calling us to say look there's urgency about this there's urgency about our spiritual walk and i guess the question would be have you set your heart on things above Or are you trying to get all you can from this world? The question is, am I a kingdom person? Am I a kingdom person when it comes to the stuff of this life and the next life? This stuff matters. This stuff. Father, help us to be about the things of the kingdom and do whatever we can with whatever we can to align ourselves with your will. Father, would you remove from us sins, behaviors, attitude that doesn't align with your purpose and will and grace. Father, would you help us not to be distracted by the things of this world, but to be committed to our eternal kingdom. Father, help us to be good stewards of the blessings that we have in this life that we might count ourselves worthy of true riches of which you have in store which defy our imagination. Would you still our hearts quiet our active minds 
help us to focus on you and be willing at a heart level to put aside everything that might get in the way of a relationship with Christ. Forgive us, Father. Forgive us for times when we have been lazy, indifferent, self-centered. Forgive us for times when we have not listened to your holy word, but only to our own thoughts and motives. Father, help us as your people to be your people. Help us to walk in your ways. To please you. May we be constantly motivated with the things we say and how we say it and what we do to please you, to give you glory and honor. Thank you for your mercies. Thank you for bearing with us. Thank you for your kindness. We pray, Father, as we leave this time of the parables, that something has stuck. Oh, Lord, I've preached my heart out from these parables. I pray that something has stuck, and that lives are changed, that paths are straightened, that hope is realized. Father, take your word and just let it take root within us as we leave this study of the parables and move on. I just pray that you would, each one of us here would be a little closer to the kingdom as a result. I pray, as always, I pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Let's stand and sing.